So yes, if you'll recall from a couple of weeks ago, uh, this uh, this Mishnah, which um, begins Masechet Rosh Hashanah, um, immediately problematizes the concept of Rosh Hashanah, of the idea that there is a new year, um, a, 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 a day where we mark the beginning of the new year, um, by saying actually there are multiple days that count as the new year, depending on what you're doing with them. Um, and so we have here this list of the of the new years. Uh, now, for our purposes tonight, um, what I want to focus on here is we'll take a look at the English first, just so you see um, what's uh, what's going on here. Um, this is this is a, a a a much more accurate English translation than you might expect. Uh, on the first of Shvat is the new year for the tree, in accordance with the statement of Beit Shammai. But Beit Hillel says. It's on the 15th of Shvat. Um, now, the new year for the tree is a little bit of an odd construction in English. Um, and if you look up here, it is the same in Hebrew. Rosh Hashanah La Ilan, Kedivre Beit Shammai. So it's Bachat Beshvat, Ben Beit Hillel Omrim, Bachamisha Sarbo. So what we're focusing on here is why does it not say, why does it not say for trees? Why does it simply say tree, the tree, the new year for the tree? It's a weird way to speak. Um, and before we can sort of delve into where we might be going with that, um, I want to bring just one more, one more piece of evidence here from further on in the Mishnah. Um, so if you're following along, in the, in the Gemara, it's Rosh Hashanah 16a. And we see here, not only are there four Rosh Hashanahs, four New Year's, there are four days of judgment, four um, Yamim Hadin, um, sort of corresponding to, um, to, 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 our, to our Yom Kippur. Um, and, and, and so just as we have problematized the concept of the New Year Day, we're now problematizing the concept of the Day of Judgment. And we explain here the four days, uh, the four times a year on which the world is judged. On Passover, judgment is passed concerning grain. On Shavuot, concerning fruits they have here that grow on a tree. Um, on Rosh Hashanah, all creatures pass before him like sheep. As it is stated, he who fashions their heart alike, who considers all their deeds. And on the festival of Sukkot, they are judged concerning water. So interesting here. Yom Kippur not on the list, um, strangely enough, although probably it's, um, it's, it's, it's wrapped up in Rosh Hashanah, presumably. Um, but, uh, but once again, um, if, we, if we look in the Hebrew here, um, we have the singular. Ba'atzeret, atzeret means Shavuot in the Mishnaic Hebrew. Ba'atzeret al perot ha'ilan. So on Shavuot, concerning the fruit of the tree, singular. This could just be an idiomatic expression. It could just be the way people talk. Um, but from our point of view, it seems a little strange. And we say, what is the tree? And so the rabbi or rabbis who wrote the Zohar, they know. They're, they're pretty confident they know what this tree is. It's not the tree in your backyard. It's not the tree that uh, you see on the, in, in the woods or something like that. Um, this tree is the tree of life, the Etz Chaim. Okay, so what is that? What does that mean? We have a couple of primary sources that um, come to explain to us what the tree of life is. Um, the first will sound familiar to us. Um, this is from Proverbs 3, 17, 18. Um, so we actually sing it in the reverse uh, at the end of the Torah service, but um, it's, it's an exact quote other than the fact that the verses are out of order. Um, so this is a tree of life. Um, and you say, okay, so what is, what, is, what is this? What is she? What is the, what is the Etz Haim 
he it's Chaim he what is the he what is the the the, the feminine here um Torah if you're in if you're in the Torah service that's the obvious implication right we're coming to the end of the Torah service we've lifted it up and we've read from it and we've kissed it and we've marched it around the room and now we're putting it back in the ark and we're singing something here is a tree of life and it's uh its ways are the ways of pleasantness um but here this is the fun part about safaria is we can take a look we can click on the link here and scroll up so we got a lot, whoever this she is, whoever this lady is, um, there are a lot of nice things to say about her. But then here's the answer. Ashrei adam matzah hochma, adam yafik tvuna. So happy is the man who finds wisdom, the man who attains understanding. So it's wisdom and understanding that are the tree of life. Not Torah if you take this hyper literally. And so then the question is essentially what's, what's going on here? You know, how can, uh, you know, I mean, what, okay. So wisdom is a tree of life. That sounds very nice. I mean, I think we would all sort of like nod our heads kind of automatically like, yeah, it's good to be smart. Good to not do dumb things. Okay, sure. Um, but then what, um, what does this mean? And the answer is in the next line here. Hashem b'hochma yisad aretz, konan shemaim itvuna. So the Lord founded the earth by wisdom. He established the heavens by understanding. So what is this wisdom? What is this understanding? This is the blueprint for the universe. This is God's Whatever God's toolbox was to create the universe, that's what we have here. And that's what we're able to tap into. Um, the book of Proverbs, which is often um, sort of misunderstood as a collection of like Benjamin Franklin style aphorisms, um, but is actually incredibly deep if you go on to chapter eight in the book of proverbs wisdom herself begins to speak so wisdom in this sort of personified sense begins to speak and tell you about herself tell you about her journey tell you about how she was the first thing created by god through which god created everything else so, I mean, we could do a whole class on that, but um, we, should, uh, we should jump back in um, to our, our question, which is about the tree of life, about this, um, this metaphor for the tree of life. So that's one of our sources. Um, and then our other source comes from the Torah itself, from Genesis 2.9, from the creation story. And from the ground, the Lord God caused to grow every tree that was pleasing to the sight and good for food with the tree of life in the middle of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and bad. Now, I'm assuming this is a fairly familiar um, source text for, for most of you that you've, 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 you've read this, you're familiar with the story, the six days of creation, Adam and Eve eating the fruit and being banished from the garden. Um, there's a lot there. There's a lot that people know. There's a lot that people sort of, they, they think they know. And, and then, and then you actually, if you, you know, show me in the book of Genesis where it says apple, you're not going to, you're not going to find it. It's not there. Um, the rabbis have um, a, a lengthy debate about which fruit it is. Um, and they have a lot of different theories. Uh, but apple is never one of them. Apple, apple never shows up on, on their list. Um, but we have here in the earliest moment of creation. We have this reference to a tree of life. And we have this idea that Adam, um, the first human being, has access to the tree of life. And the tree of life stands in the the center of the, um, of the Garden of Eden stands in the place 
where 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 God has sort of put us all to um um to 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 sort of live our live our ideal lives, you might say. So all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna pop out here just just for a second so that so that we can talk. Um because there's 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 a lot going on here. So we have we're in danger of terribly mixing our metaphors here because we we have already determined that the tree of life is a tree in the garden and it's also wisdom and understanding and maybe what we know from shul is that it's torah also how can those be a tree is really the question that we were sort of forced to get at what's the utility of a tree as a metaphor what do we think of when we think of a tree and why would it be useful to think of a tree as the personification of wisdom what do people think why isn't it a reference to the the tree of knowledge if we're talking about wisdom isn't that a closer reference to 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 every to Torah and everything we're talking about, it would certainly seem so, right? Yeah, I mean, the like, which tree is going to be the tree of wisdom and of understanding? Presumably, the tree of knowledge, and yet Proverbs, Proverbs three nineteen is very specific. It's it's Chaim he, yeah. So it's it is the tree of life. Um, and what is the relationship between these two trees? I mean, that's a huge question. That goes beyond this class. What is the relationship between the tree of knowledge and the tree of life? The Zohar says they're actually the same tree. They just look different um, on the ground. But um, it's like, uh, or you know, they're, they're sort of, you see this sometimes with trees. They sort of grow together and they become one tree um, or they, they act like one tree. And, um, and, and, and there's, there's, there's certainly some sense there. But the tree of life uh, seems to be the more, um, more important one in a sense. I mean, that's the, that's, that's the sense you get from the fact that it's in the center. It's in the exact center. Um, the Midrash says, you know, God put it in the center of the garden because that's what you do with the most important thing. You, um, you, don't, you don't hide it on the, on the edge of town. You don't stick it. Um, you know, buried in your ex exterior wall, you you hide it in the middle. You put it in the center where it can be kept safe. And that was the tree that they didn't eat from. They ate from the tree of knowledge, and right. then they got kicked out before they might think about eating from the tree of life. God seemed to be concerned, maybe even afraid might be the right word. What happens if they eat the tree of knowledge and eat the tree of life? That seems to be um, a, a bad outcome as far as God is concerned, to the point where they have to get kicked out. Yeah, Lou. To my understanding, the Torah is the tree. The Torah is the tree of life. That's from whatever everything comes from. And the wisdom is the, in the studying of the Torah and the understanding because the tree of life comes from within. And that's what guides your life is the Torah or the laws. These are the things that are put down there. And so I think the tree of life to me is the Torah and these, th these trees are branches of those trees that make it up. So I think there's one, I don't know if that makes any sense, but that's what I think. Sure, sure, yeah, thank you, thank you. All right, so let's let's get back into the text here because we've got, we've got a little bit of Zohar that will offer an explanation um, of, of how, these, how these ideas can sort of all be pulled together here. All right, so Rabbi Shimon said, the Holy Blessed One placed Adam at first in the Garden of Eden and gave him the Torah in order to labor in her and observe her commandments. As scripture writes, the tree of life is in the midst of the garden, and she is a tree of life to those who hold on to her. Therefore, the Holy Blessed One said, when Adam will have pleasures in this garden, 
uh, that should be he, will immerse himself in her and observe her. But because of the delights and pleasures that Adam partook of there, he did not fulfill God's Torah, and he was therefore banished from there. So what, um, what the Zohar is, um, is, is sort of referencing here is, is, is this, um, this idea that the, um, the Torah, I, I, presumably the Torah that we have, the Torah that, um, the, you know, more or less what we have, um, is, um, is in fact older than the, the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai. Um, the, the Torah is um, at least as old as human beings themselves. Um, and, 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 and this is, um, you know, and, 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 and not only, not only does it, does it have that same age, but it has, it has sort of primordial utility too. Um, if you, if you just sort of read the, the text of the Torah, um, and, and, you know, just see what's there and what's not there, you wouldn't get any sense that Adam is Torah observant or knowledgeable of the Torah in any way. Adam has one mitzvah and he fails and it's a mitzvah that's completely irrelevant for us in a practical way um, because you know we, we, we don't avoid eating any tree just because Adam ate that tree, right? Um, in fact, the rabbis specifically say that uh, the reason the tree is left unnamed is lest some particularly pious people decide to say, no, nah, don't eat that because Adam ate that. So you better not eat figs anymore because that was the, that was the naughty tree. Um, and so uh, rather than risk uh, ruining a perfectly good tree for, for the rest of us, uh, it's, it's, it's simply left unstated. And so we have no idea what the tree was, but we do know that Adam appears to only have one mitzvah that he fails. Um, there's no indication he has the Ten Commandments or the seven mitzvot of Noah, um, and certainly not the 613 mitzvahs of the of our Torah. Yeah, Lou. Yeah, but Adam, Adam is the, is the part of the Torah. That's just a story. You know, they had to have a story. Okay, the first man was created. the The heart of the Torah is in the commandments. Thou shalt not kill, thou, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and and, and the, the Torah is a way of life, is the 613, you know, commandments. Uh, you know, uh, it, it's, it's a, a way to live your life. Uh, and I think that Adam is just, I mean, the first, I think the first book of, 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 of the five books is just a story to, you know, for background, okay? I don't think that that's the importance of of the Torah. The Torah probably comes in Deuteronomy or something like that. So yeah, I I, I appreciate your point of view, and and I think there there's a lot uh, there's there's a lot to um to be said for it. I I think people people who would say you know we we need the we need the background, we need to understand who the players are. I mean, this is this is basically Rashi's explanation of the book of Genesis, that um, if you just got the other sections of the Torah, if you just got the 613 meets vote, you would read it and you would say, well, who's God to tell me to do these things? Um, you need the background, you need the story. Uh, that is that is a, a perfectly legitimate way to, to, to look at things. Um, but um, but what, I'm, what I'm sharing with you right now is that the Zohar does not agree with you about that. The Zohar, sees the 613 meets vote permeating the book of Genesis and specifically the, um, the six days of creation. The six days of creation are overflowing with the 613 meets vote um, in, in, in ways that are, that, are, that are not easy to see or perhaps impossible to see on a, on a surface level. And so that's why, uh, that's why the Zohar um, really, really digs so deep to, um, to try to understand you know what? What exactly happened that 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 allowed the world to be created? Um, and this is why it leans so so heavily on on that Proverbs line that we just saw that with wisdom God created 
the the the, the heaven and earth, um, which is to say that Torah, um, you know, God is the um, God's the homeowner, but Torah is the contractor. Torah is the one who actually had to had to do the building, um, and and so the whole world is constructed by Torah on behalf of God, um, and 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 this is. You, not everyone has to agree with this, and certainly not everyone does agree with this. But um, but this is this is a sort of basic uh, basic premise of of Kabbalah is that um, we have we have the world that we know, and we have a God who we can barely understand. And how you get from the one to the other is through a series of emanations. And that's actually, this is a good segue because this is the, this is the next thing that, um, that I want to talk to you about. Um, because if you can imagine, imagine a, a, imagine a world without a world. I know that's, that's a big thing. Um, but imagine you were all that there is and you're just sort of floating in a void and there's nothing in the world except for you. It'd be very different, right? And you would be very different. I mean, this is this is something that we're we're coming coming to realize in um, in, in in our time about the um, the 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 utter torture that is putting prisoners in solitary confinement. There is there is something you know psychologically quite destructive about loneliness. Um, I think some of us have um, have experienced that in a new way during during the past couple of years. Is uh, you know we've we've you know faced stay-at-home orders and this sort of thing, and this is the the kabbalistic understanding of the creation of the world is that God was in some way um, unhappy, dissatisfied, see, uh, seeking more, searching for more. Um, now that that might have been relational. It could be that God wanted someone to love. God wanted someone to be in relationship with. Um, others say that it's more um, a better metaphor is imagine if you had um, if you had a mirror, but you're just holding it up to your face like this. You can't see anything. You can't see yourself. In order to see yourself, you got to pull the mirror back a little bit. And that's what the creation of the world is, is God pulling that mirror back a little bit. In all of these things, there's this idea that it doesn't happen in one stroke. It doesn't happen in one easy pass. It happens through, um, through a sort of spiritual, spiritual labor or, or spiritual, you know, maybe in both senses of the English word. Um, it's, you know, a, a, a time of, uh, of, of great work and a time of, uh, of giving birth in a sense. And the Kabbalistic term for this is tzimtzum. Tzimtzum means contraction. And so this is when God takes some part of the world and removes God's self from it. And so the sort of undifferentiated undiffer mass that was God now shrinks down and gets more tightly compacted. These are, these are metaphors, of course. You shouldn't take this too literally. Um, this is just a, a way to try to explain it in human terms. Um, but you can, you can sort of imagine you know, God as a, as a gas and you can, you can you know, sort of tighten the, tighten the gas up a little bit. So now you, have, now you have the spot where God is and you have the spot where God isn't. Um, and this was new because previously there had only been God. There had only been the spot where God is. But, um, and it was called Ein Sof, Ein Sof, without end. And this Ein Sof is sort of God, is an undifferentiated, and maybe even, depending on who you ask, an unconscious entity. This is God sort of beyond self-awareness. Because self-awareness can only happen when you have something to compare yourself to. You have something that you are not. You, you can look and you say, oh, I'm the baby and that's the mommy. You know, I mean, that's sort of the, the primordial self-awareness. Um, and, and that doesn't happen immediately for humans. 
Um, it takes uh, takes babies a little bit of time to realize that they are they are differentiated. Um, and so when you have this um, this separation, this tsimtsum, um, then um, then then the, the the sort of the the world, the void world, the world without God, is um, is just like absolutely desperate to have God flow back in. And what ends up happening, according to the Kabbalists, is that God flows back in through a series of emanations. Um, now, this is this is sort of hard to hard to explain, hard to imagine in your mind, um, but it's um, it's a it's it's a little bit like um, like the flow of electricity through through a wire. You know, um, this this is sort of in the nature of metals. That um, that you know, an electron can just go from one atom to the next to the next, and it just sort of flows across without uh, without without any any problem. And um, you know, if you if you have a sort of classical concept of chemistry in your mind, you say, okay, well, there's the protons and there's the matching electrons, and you say, okay, well, where's which which uh, which which atom, which molecule do these electrons belong to? And the answer is. Um, that, um, that 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 would be sort of a, a, a snapshot in time that would probably be an inappropriate way to, to look at the, the flow of energy. Well, there's a similar flow of energy happening um, with the with the sphere out. I tried to find a good um, picture to share with you. This one's pretty good. This one's OK. I'm sure you've seen something like this before. I'm sure you're you're familiar with the with the sphere out. Uh, you've you've at least uh, you've at least seen this in in artistic depictions. So the um, that contraction that seam zoom that we spoke of, where the Ain Sof sort of shrinks down and becomes um, you know something something with some specificity to it. Uh, we think of that as this top one here that we call Keter. Keter means a uh, crown, and this is the sort of first emanation and also in a sense the most difficult one you can imagine something can become something it's fairly easy for something to become something it's harder for nothing to become something and likewise it's harder for everything to become something that's sort of the um the the inverse of uh, of, of creation out of nothing imagine everything but now it has to be some things and not other things so that's the biggest leap that you can you can imagine is um, is from Ensof to Keter. And once Keter is uh, is present um, and the and the world is sort of drawing it and, and God wants to be drawn as well. Um, and, and so you have these sort of emanations of relationship that flow into the world. Um, explaining this would take weeks if not months to get into all of the details and this stuff is just amazing it's so deep it's so wild the list of things that i i was trying to come up with how to teach this class and the list of things that i had to leave out um is like 10 times longer than what i was able to to leave in because there is there's so much going on here um, and 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 it, and it really gets to the to the deepest possible questions. But I just want to very very quickly give you a sense here. So these are expressions of God, um, and it's very hard to explain what that means exactly. Um, but you know, you you can sort of think of it as the 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 way you might relate to. Well, you know, this is a good metaphor for me. I always talk about being, you know, you know fatherhood and, and parenthood and this sort of thing. But you can imagine a relationship with children where, you know, you have a great love for them and you also need to be stern with them from time to time. Um, there are times when my children do things that are just hilarious and I'm laughing on the inside, but I know that I cannot encourage this sort of behavior. So I'm just stone faced on the outside. Um, because in some ways, you know, we're all complicated beings, we're all complicated creatures, and we display ourselves in different ways. And God is the same. God is displaying in different ways. God is relating to us in multiple ways. And unlike human beings for whom our, um, our, our, our sort of particulars of the relationship 
are um, are, are are you know finite as we are finite um, because God is infinite. When you take a slice of the infinite, it is also infinite. Then and and so these slices of God end up being God in totality as a slice. Now I know that doesn't make any sense. Um, this stuff doesn't always completely make sense. Um, if if we could understand it completely, we we would we we probably wouldn't be human beings. Um, so so that's what's going on here. Is these are different ways that God relates to human beings. These are different ways that God relates uh, specifically to the Jewish people quite often. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I think we can sort of, we could imagine times where we say, okay, so the God of judgment, we, yeah, we, we see that God in, in our scripture, in our Torah, we see that God, the God of kindness, we know, we know that God as well. And the God who balances the two, balances judgment and kindness, this God of harmony, this God of Tiferet, um, we, we see, we, we certainly see that as well. So I'll just, I'll just, this is a very quick survey. This is a very quick overview. So the way the Kabbalists understand this diagram here, you see that there's the one that's dashed, the knowledge. So knowledge, um, Da'at and Keter are sort of the same thing. So Keter is, knowledge, is, is sort of knowledge in an unconscious form. And as it becomes actualized, as it becomes you know, made manifest in the world, the keter sort of falls down, the crown falls symbolically and becomes da'at. Um, and then you have these, these top three here, the top three sort of stand um, as, their, as their own, the, the, the chokhmah, bina, and da'at. Um, and if you've ever spent time at Chabad, that's where their acronym comes from, actually. Um, and then you have the, 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 the lower ones that um, become God more, um, you know, more relatable, more human seeming. I mean, God is, God is never going to be exactly like us, but we do believe that God is a, um, a person in the sense of being someone with a will, someone with thoughts, someone with feelings, not a human, obviously, but um, not inanimate either, not just an idea or an abstraction. God is someone capable of love, capable of uh, anger, capable of relationship. And so these are the ways that God relates to people. Um, and sort of as we fall down the spectrum here, things become a lot more uh, approachable to us, uh, to the point where uh, the the Kabbalists say this final one here, Malchut, is probably the this is this is Malchut is the um, the God who is most imminent, most apparent. It's Malchut who's hanging out in the temple in Jerusalem when we say God is uniquely there. God is uniquely present, uh, and you might wonder. You say, well, God's everywhere. How can God be in the tent? Like, how does that make sense? Um, and it's Malchut. It's God's um, emanation, God's most, most, most imminent emanation, um, that is also sometimes called Shekhinah, the, 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 the you know, divine presence, uh, which is often, um, you know, thought of as God's, God's feminine aspect. So that's, a, that's another thing to know, is that these are sometimes, uh, sometimes counted, sort of, it's, it's, it's left and center, and then right and center, um, and the left is thought to be um, God's feminine power, um, and the right is thought to be God's um, God's masculine power. Um, and 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 so there, um, you know, it, it's it's God. God is both. God is all. God is neither at the same time. Um, uh, we'll we'll have a little more to say about this. I'm going to throw one more thing at you. Just to, this is just an aside. This is just fun. Um, but you see here, there are 10 Svirot, except you have Keter and Da'at, so maybe it's sort of 11. Um, 10 that's sort of also 11 is the same as the number of dimensions in string theory. Now, I don't know what to do with that fact, but I spoke to, I spoke to a physicist about this once, and she said, yeah, no, that, that, there, there could be something there, and she doesn't know what to do with it either, <laughs> but, um, it's um it's 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 fascinating stuff. I'll pop out here just to to sort of check in because I know I know we've entered the twilight zone at this point. I know I know this is pretty pretty wild stuff. 
Um, does anyone have any questions or thoughts or concerns you want to check in about this? I, uh, I study Tanya every week, and um, I like to think of that chart as kind of the anatomy of our, anatomy of our soul, too. And um, a, a premise that, you know, you learn in Hasidus is that the, uh, the more intellectual realms, the Chabad, Chokma Bina Vadat, are um, our, God has given us those to help to exercise really control and to harness the other more emotional uh, emotional portions of us. But it, it, it's just an absolute fascinating world that it, it, it's shocking when you're first introduced to it, like you're introducing it now because it's like, wow, where did this come from? And is this awesome? I mean, this is just so way out. But I see it almost like a medical student must see when they go into their anatomy class mm -hmm. The first year of medical school, it's like it's it's just a big, huge mess until you have, are able to sort of get familiarized with it. So I appreciate that you're trying to do this in one fell swoop like this. Right. It's, it's <laughs> it a can't big really task. be done. This is just a a little survey, you know. Um, but yeah, Joanna, you you bring up a great point, which is that um, so 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 this understanding. Um, uh, of, 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 of the Spirot. This is, this is a sort of earlier form of Kabbalah. It's not the same as the Lurianic Kabbalah that becomes so popular out of Tzfat, although you could certainly find this in plenty of paintings for sale in Tzfat today. Um, but um, the different, uh, different Kabbalistic conceptions don't always line up. Um, and the great uh, Hasidic innovation was to say, that um, as much as you want to talk about these as metaphors for God, they are also metaphors for understanding human nature. Um, that, um, that, that, you know, especially the, the you know, the, the sort of first three spherot being, um, you know, sort of more in the realm of intellect, and then it falls into the, more the realm of emotion, and then finally action. You know, these are ways to think about our own lives, our own choices. Um, and and, and I, I don't see those as, as necessarily um, contradictory either. I mean, how else would we understand God but through through our own through our own lens, through our own perspective? So of course we see a sort of a parallel between between godliness and, and, and humanity. What I think about is uh, a, a psychic energy. When, when uh, Freud was writing about uh, how, how the mind works, he talked about psychic energy and uh, how we uh, how we control it because uh, it can destroy us or it can give us great pleasure and joy. How do you keep it under control? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, there there is some evidence, by the way, that Freud knew this sort of stuff. That Freud, uh, without was... question, he knew this stuff. As the Yitzhak Hara and Yitzhak Tov sound almost like you know. The id impulse and the uh, sex aggression. I mean, uh, he he pretended that he was all uh, everything was based on Greek mythology, but I think uh, it was more than that. Right, right. Excellent. All right. So, tell you what, we will uh, we'll keep moving here because um, you know as long as as long as we're discussing metaphor which you know this ultimately is all metaphor um you know you, you you know we can't understand god i mean that'd be weird if we if we could um it, 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 it it's illogical to imagine that we could understand god and so we're forced to grasp with these uh with these metaphors um but they 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 help they get us they get us uh, you know a, a lot of the way so the next metaphor that i want to share um, this is uh, this is this is a sort of later Kabbalistic understanding, which you you may have encountered if you've ever spent any time in the uh, with the renewal movement um, and the the neo Hasidut of, of the renewal movement. Um, this is uh, is very much at the heart of what they do, um, and and it's it's very much along the lines of what Lenny was just talking about the the, the way sort of modern psychology lines up with um, with Kabbalah. So. This is the, um, the the four worlds Kabbalah. This is called, and the four worlds are sort of four 
for destinations in our in our understanding. So um, the first is atzilut, um, which is you could think of it in a sense of sort of like a platonic archetype, um, or if you've ever had an idea just pop into your mind, and you say, "Oh, I should, I should build a house," and you just sort of, you know, you just have a house pop into your mind. Um, you don't have a plan. You don't know what it's going to look like, and you, you know, you, I mean, you have a you have a picture in your mind, but you you haven't mapped out every single room. You don't you don't know, you know, are, is, are the doors going to open in or out? Uh, which, uh, you know, is the master bathroom going to have, you know, how many sinks? I mean, you, you, you have a sense of it. It just sort of pops into your mind, but you don't have all the details worked out. Um, so that's, that's Atsilut. Atsi um, you have this sense, but you don't actually know. So this is, um, in the creation story, this is God's initial desire. This is God's initial want to create, to relate, to have a world um, in which God can be God. Um, and, 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 and it has to be manifest in some way. And so the way you manifest it is to go from the idea emerging in your head to some specificity. And that's Bria, that's creation. That's the second of the four worlds is that now you have to have a plan. Now you have to come up with a plan. Now, you know, to continue our, our house building metaphor, now you have to um, hire an architect and you need to sit down and plan out uh, what every, every room is gonna look like and is it gonna be carpeted or are we gonna have hardwood floor? I mean, there, there are a million things to figure out. Um, and that's, that's, you know, ideally, hopefully you're planning ahead when you do this. And God planned ahead in the creation of the world. Um, and that's Torah. That's the creation. That's the sort of Torah, not, not, in, not necessarily in our sense of Torah. I um, mean, we're not talking about a, a you know, a, a book on a piece of parchment, um, but it is the manifestation of God's will sort of turned specific, turned into, well, you know, the world is going to have this many continents and it's going there's going to be an ocean on there and don't forget Mars and the Andromeda galaxy. And I mean, it, it, it all, it all gets, uh, it all, it all gets, you know, much, much beyond our ability to understand. Um, if you're talking about the creation of something akin to this, this universe, I mean, this universe is just enormous. Um, but that's that's the that's the sort of second level of emanation, and the third yitzira is formation. This is when you you are buying the land, you are building, uh, not you're not you're not building, you're 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 buying the materials. You've got you've got all of your all of your two by fours and your nails, and you're you're ready to build the house. Um, and in the creation story, this is when God would speak. This is when God said let there be light. This is, you know, not, not the, not what comes next, not what happens, you know, a second later, but in that moment where God is, you know, this could be a whole class also, but what, you know, what does it mean exactly when God opens God's mouth and speaks? Um, but in this context, it is that moment of will, that moment of externalized will, when you say, okay, we're going to do the thing. We have the plan. We have the desire. We have the stuff. And now here it's going to be. And that leads into the fourth level of the four worlds, Asiya, which literally means doing. Um, and this is the physical. This is where there is something beyond ourselves, something beyond our own understanding. You can, you, you can look and there, oh, the, the, you know, the crew has, has built the house. There it is. Um, and in, in, in the creation story, this is when there is the thing. You know, God said, let there be light. And there was light. That's the, that's the Asiya, is the, the manifestation of it into the world. And so this, um, the reason we have the Svirot here on the left um, is that these four 
levels, these four worlds are often thought to correspond to, um, to, to different spherot um, in, our, in our 10 sphera conception here. Um, and so, so Atsilut is, is more, you know, because it's more in the realm of archetype, it's more in the realm of thought. Um, and so it, it, it's more closely aligned with the, with the top three um, and, you know, and, and, and so on down the line. But there's also um, this idea that you have, um, I'm going to pop out just briefly to switch, switch slides here. So you have this idea that um, each of the worlds, each of the four worlds has its own 10 spherot and that each one sort of emanates out of the malchut of the previous one. So out, so you're sort of at the top and you work your way down. When you get to the last sphere on the bottom, that expands into 10 more. And you go all the way down to the bottom and it expands again into 10 more. And you do this, um, you do this four times. Um, and and that, that gets you something that looks roughly like this. So, um, Again, you know, these, this is all, this is all metaphor. It's, it's nothing to be taken overly literally. Um, but this sort of super emanation where we are attempting to understand the, the spherotic levels within levels, um, it becomes, um, it, well, like you know, conceptually, it's a bit of a mess here on, uh, uh, looking, looking at it, you know, sort of from an artistic perspective, um, but you can imagine, um, you know, the the complexity of this world unfolding. Um, this particular piece of, of of sort of artistic depiction is um, is known as uh, as Jacob's ladder, um, and and it is uh, it is it is said that uh, in in Kabbalistic thought that this is what Jacob was seeing. Um, in his uh, in his dream, when he saw the angels going up and down a ladder, well, this was it. This was what he was looking at. He was looking at the emanations of godliness that um, that that somehow um, the 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 end result is us. The end result is our our created our created world. And so this is the tree of life. This is the Etz Chaim in um that that the, 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 the we see so it is hochmah and it is binan it is torah it is it is all of those things and it is uh it it, it, it kind of looks like a tree also and like a tree it continues to grow or maybe if you want to you know look at the metaphor differently you can sort of slice it in the middle here and like a tree it's got its branches above and its roots below and it's um, you know it's it, it's a it's a it's a beautiful metaphor, a beautiful image, um, um, and I want to I want to take us back to the um, to our to our text that we were that we were looking at initially, and then uh, and then we'll 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 have a few more minutes for questions here. But if we if we can go back to our text from Masechet Rosh Hashanah, um, where we had the four Rosh Hashanahs. Um, followed by the four days of judgment. Um, and so our, our, our Rosh Hashanah for trees or the tree was Tu Bishvat. That's our Rosh Hashanah for the tree, which we understand to be the Etz Chaim, the tree of life. And so what is the Yom Kippur? What is the day of judgment for Tu Bishvat, for the tree? You know, how do you line these up? And what, which one was it? It was... Shavuot. And Shavuot, believe it or not, it is coming. It might not feel like it, but here on Tu Bishvat, we have marked the end of the rainy season in Israel, and now we're in the growing season. And the growing season will be soon enough marked by Purim. And then what do you have in Purim? Well, that's sort of your your alarm bell that you've got a month till Pesach. And then um, you've got your Omer period, your 49 days leading in to Shavuot. So all of this is the growing season. And this is why the Omer period, uh, the 49 days are usually in the Kabbalistic understanding thought to each have 
a sphera within a sphera. Um, you take the seven lower spherot, you sort of multiply them together, and that gets you 49 days. And if you look at most cedarim, will have the list. You know, is this is the this is the 39th day, and it's you know this sphera within this sphera, and it's because of this four worlds emanation that we are looking at the spherot within the spherot um, because we are entering into our growing season. We're entering into this, um, this time of year where we, uh, where we have this sort of special, special connection to, um, to the tree of life. Um, I'll throw one more text at you. If we had more time, if we had another 20 minutes, this is what I would do with you. Um, but we, we already saw from the Zohar um, this text about how Adam had the Torah uh, in the Garden of Eden. Um, and then, and then he, he lost it somehow. Well, I mean, we know how, we know how he lost it. Um, um, Rish Lakish in Masechet um, Avodah Zarah in the, in the Talmud, he, he says that, um, that Adam and Eve had immortality and they lost it um, because they had the tree of life and they lost it. Um, the Jewish people were given the same Etz Chaim. We were given the same Torah and the same promise of life everlasting. And then we immediately lost it at the sin of the golden calf. Um, but that everything that has flowed since then, everything that happened since Cheda Ego, since the sin of the golden calf, has been a repair as we are working toward that, um, that primordial connection, that primordial connection um, that, that goes you know, from, through, for us through Moses all the way back to Adam, all the way back to the first human being who is himself the fifth world of the four worlds. Adam HaKadmon, the primordial Adam, um, stands as the ultimate um, uh, emanation and depiction of God uh, as we human beings are able to understand God. All right, that was a lot. That was a whole lot. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously we had to skip a few things and summarize a few things. Um, but I, I'd love to, to hear people's thoughts or questions or anything at all. I have a question. Um, did you say that the day, the judgment day for Tubashvat is Shavuot? So it's the judgment day for trees. Uh, Tu itself is the judgment day. For no, Tu is the New Year's day for trees. And Shavuot oh. is the judgment okay. day for trees, except it doesn't so say tree, it says the tree. So, so this, is, this is the question that the, that the Zohar is asking. Is the tree just a way to say trees? And they say, no, the tree is the Etz Chaim. It is the, the tree of life. So, all right. Well, this well, was also fun. the thing with the spirit and spirit because you were talking about during the Omer. Um, yeah. You know, like uh, during the Omer period, it's like I'll download the apps, and the apps will have that, and sometimes, you know, spiritual exercises to do for each day. But I never really understood what it was like. Each week was one with other ones superimposed on them. Right. So, right. So. Yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty weird, isn't it? <laughs> uh and yeah this this stuff this stuff is really wild and we didn't even get in i mean we, like the the number of things we skipped tonight is like through the charts off the charts but um but yeah there you know ultimately this was um you know the, the, this the, these are about sort of the questions of ultimate meaning um and so for the kabbalists they took they took tubishvat as this as this invitation to you know, to to really enter into the um, this this half of the year, you know, we you can you can more or less split the year in two, um, and, and you've got your sort of your fall holidays and your spring holidays, um, and we are we're we're well into the spring holidays, um, uh, you know, by 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 the time by the time this is all over, and this is and this is the this is the beginning of that. So start start thinking about about your shovel oak plans, I guess. <laughs>